Hey everyone and welcome back to another video with us. In this week's video we explore around stunning Shropshire. The Augustine Abbey at Lillishaw is around 6 miles north of Telford and founded some time between the years of 1145 and 1148 for a group of Arroatians from Dorchester Abbey in Oxfordshire. The extensive standstone still remains and is now kept by the English heritage, who let people explore these ruins for free, set within a peaceful and isolated location, amid lawns where you can wander and imagine the black cannons doing their daily worship. It's difficult to associate anywhere as beautiful and tranquil as Lillishaw Abbey with turbulence, violence and hauntings, but it certainly had its fair share of all three. So join us as we wander the ruins of Lillishaw Abbey. The beautiful ruins of the Abbey sit lonely and unnoticed at the end of a farm track, tucked away in an unexpected sleepy corner of the Shropshire countryside. The decaying walls of the Abbey are shielded from the nearby road by a line of trees and feel distinctly remote and sheltered from the outside world. Your first viewpoint is that of the still impressive west front with a huge central doorway and a round arch. It's quite striking against the red sandstone wall. This western end though was finished in the 13th century and the round arch is meant to complement the earlier work that is visible through the portal. We're quite fortunate in that we have an abundance of scenic abbeys in Shropshire. Some, such as Wenlock Priory, predate back to the Norman invasion of 1066, but many, such as Bildwas, Hormond and Lillishaw, were established by the conquering Normans. Bildwas was established by the most powerful of the monastic orders in Europe, the Cistercians. Hormond and Lillishaw here, however, were both built by members of the Augustinian order. Members of the Augustinian order were never noted for their intellectual powers or their religious rigour, but clearly the founding fathers of this abbey were good managers. Within a hundred years of its founding, Lillishaw Abbey already had a large portfolio of properties, not just in Shropshire, but also in Staffordshire, Warwickshire, Derbyshire, Cheshire and even a large house in London. These outlying estates were managed by a resident steward and a monk who would have had to have visited regularly from Lillishaw to check that all was in order. Lillishaw was a very wealthy abbey due to its land-based economy. The land was worked by both servants, who were people who were bound to do certain amount of unpaid work, which may seem rather unchristian notion to our modern eyes, but also it was worked by waged labourers. The reason for this outsourcing of labour was that unlike the earthy Cistercians who worked the land, Augustinian monks preferred managing their assets rather than getting their hands dirty. It seems that they didn't care much for domestic matters either. Records from the 14th century show that Lillishaw employed two porters, a butler, a chamberlain, two cooks, a baker, a bell ringer, a cobbler, a washerwoman, a carpenter, several apprentices, a tanner and a brewer. The land owned by Lillishaw Abbey not only provided all of its food, it also produced rents and taxes. The abbey was very wealthy by the late 13th century, as it drew wealth from legacies, gifts, farms, watermills and property investments, as well as tolls over at Atcham Bridge. Another important income stream was generated by wealthy persons who wanted to be buried within the sanctity of the abbey's precincts and they would pay generously in life for the privilege. They would also pay the monks to chant prayers every day after the death for the redemption of their immortal souls. The abbey's income suffered a huge reduction due to the depopulation of the labouring classes as a result of the Black Death in 1348 and it was two decades before it regained its wealth, which was ultimately its downfall. The Tudor dynasty had been casting a greedy eye over the riches of the Roman Catholic monasteries since the 1520s and before. Henry VIII's break with Rome in the 1530s gave him and his Chancellor, Thomas Cromwell, freedom from the papal authority, so they set about dissolving the monasteries selling off the buildings and land and taking all of the abbey's goods, possessions and treasures into royal possession. 
Lilla Schul's turn came on the 16th of October in 1538, when the abbot was given the London house and a pension whilst the remaining monks were given a small pension and sent on their way. A year later, the abbey was sold to a Wolverhampton merchant, James Leveson, who converted the vast rambling pile into a home, which he used mainly as a hunting lodge. The abbey passed through the family, largely intact until Sir Richard Leveson inherited it in the early 17th century. Leveson supported King Giles I during the Civil War and fortified the abbey, garrisoning over 160 men there. Oliver Cromwell's parliamentarian troops besieged the site, overcame the garrison and destroyed all of the buildings, leaving just the romantic ruins that we see now. To the south of the church lies the Abbey Cloister, which would have been used as a garden courtyard. The canons would have entered the church through the elaborate doorway that still stands in the northeast corner of the cloister. The zigzag pattern that you can see on this doorway features throughout the abbey. The doorway for us was extremely impressive. We love all of the detailing surrounding it and how much is very much intact still. When I look through this doorway, it really does add to the atmosphere here, which can be quite calming yet nerving, and nerving because of some of the stories that surround the abbey that still remain. Many of the original structures are now no longer in place, but the main walls of the abbey remain standing. They give a sense of grandeur that the abbey would have originally had. The abbey church would have been quite impressive back in its heyday. In the foreground was the choir with the canon's wooden choir stool set on either side, although it was difficult to know just how many canons were here at Lillishaw. The canons would gather in their choir seven times a day to celebrate their work of God. These services would run shortly after midnight and continue through to sunset. Further on from the choir would have been the presbytery. The large windows would have looked just stunning, full of stained glass and really impressive. Sadly, we were unable to visit the chapter house of the abbey, but you're able to see the abbey's chapter house to the east side of the cloister. This is where the canons would have discussed abbey business and confessed their faults. It is now the burial site of the abbots. Some grave slabs and gravestones can be seen here, but they have been restored and created, 
as the location and the details of their original occupants are not known. Surrounding the cloister, a ghost of the black monk can be seen, said to be tall, middle-aged and wearing the dark robes of the Augustinian order. He had his feet on the ground, rather than being translucent, and wanders around the cloister area with his head bowed down. There have been many stories claiming that the monk speaks to them, asking them, have you found the secret, or do you know the secret of the abbey? Whatever this secret may be, it has never been uncovered. Although, another theory is that it could have been the site of a murder in the 13th century that involved King Henry III, and one or more of the monks were involved. The king was entertained at the abbey twice around the 1240s, and was looking to make quick profits whilst he was in the Shropshire area. The king would sell titles and appointments, and he sold some including the title of sheriff. But the problem came about when there was already a sheriff in town. The sheriff found out and rode to Lillishaw to try and find out what was going on. But the sheriff never left that abbey once going in. It is believed that the ghostly monk could be the abbot of the monastery, and the secret could be the sheriff's murder. The abbot might have witnessed the murder, and continues to haunt the grounds. The grounds are very eerie. I've watched many videos here of people visiting at night, and the activity is very high. It's an interesting one, fueled by the adrenaline to see or hear the sounds, but it's definitely a place where you would be able to enjoy an evening hunted for haunted spirits, or have a lovely wonder in a tranquil setting during the day. So we hope you've enjoyed our visit to Lillishaw Abbey. If you have, please hit that like button, consider subscribing to the channel and joining our Patreon or our channel members to enable us to bring you more of these places for you. We want to say a big thank you to those who support us on the channel. So we'll see you in the next one. Till next time.